is The Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is uh, The Chris Abraham Show, Season 6, Episode 14. Um, this episode is even more controversial than the rest, because in this episode, I'm going to say that everybody who's done anything terrible in the entire world probably had their reason to do so, and probably if I were them, in their headspace, in their context, with their understanding of the world, I probably would have done exactly the same thing. Ta-da! How's that for controversial? So, I was just thinking uh, back to 2014 and then back to 1990s and back to uh, post-communist Russia. And I was actually visiting. So, uh, what, the whole wall and stuff fell apart, 89, 90, 91, 92 kind of thing. I visited... St. Petersburg in 96. And the only way I could describe St. Petersburg was um, that Grand Dame. You know that Grand Dame. She lives on the Upper West Side and she's worth a billion dollars and she's effing old. <clears throat> and if you squint with all of her plumage and all of her makeup and the fact that she was a gorgeous young girl, uh, if you, if you, if you, if you put some Vaseline or maybe a um, a stretched stocking over the lens, uh, you would, and I'm analog, right? So you can just use a filter. But if you use a little Vaseline, maybe a little bit of stocking stretched over the lens, you would see a beautiful, beautiful lady. But in 1996, Nevsky Prospect and... Uh, and all the other places, the Hotel International and the Continental and all these other fancy things and the beautiful river and uh, all the old buildings and the onion uh, churches. And it was gorgeous. But man, it was old and cracked. And you, if you put on a filter, you would have just such an amazing place, uh, such a beautiful place. My camera made it beautiful. But there were dudes in track suits and leather jackets everywhere. When I stayed in the, I, I took the train from, uh, from uh, Helsinki. Uh, I think it's called like the St. Petersburg Express or something. And it was just a straight ride from Helsinki where I was visiting Mina Aslama and Hanu Hovenyemi. Um, and uh, when I got there, there were all these like, like, gangsters and their cliche Russian mafia track suits and leather jackets and leather coats and got into the budget hotel that I ended up uh, staying in for a few days and my phone was ringing, ringing, ringing. Uh, everybody wanted to sell me a prostitute, send a prostitute up to my room. It was, wasn't dangerous. I never felt like I was in danger. Um, I feel like at that time in 1996, uh, St. Petersburg was way more bark than bite. It was more about intimidation than literally uh, street crime. So also at uh, six foot three and 280 pounds and being a, you know, literally generic white guy uh, who is half Hungarian. So I guess I've got a little bit of a Slavic vibe. I don't think anybody paid much attention to me. Um, so much fun though, but you know, Ever since then, uh, Ukraine has been a no-zone, a no-go zone. I was always surprised when I lived in Berlin how the wave of the EU and the wave of NATO was constantly moving east. And uh, I was really amazed when even uh, Bratislava in Slovakia adopted the euro because there's supposed to be some sort of economic standards, right? You can't be a... Uh, a porous fuck nation and be part of the EU. It's not uh, 
it's it's a it's a uh, tier one endeavor. Uh, however, you know, I think the uh, pressure from the West, and by the West I mean America, uh, the pressure to expand East and increase the Western hegemony uh, overwhelmed any desire to kind of make sure that you constantly pleased uh, the Germans or the Belgians or the Swiss. So they made all kinds of mistakes with freaking Greece and freaking Turkey and freaking Eastern Europe. And, you know, uh, the EU sucks now, right? Nobody cares about the EU. Not even the British are still there. And they were kind of, you know, founding fathers. So ever since then, it's always been, the Russians have always said, you know, do not mess with what we consider to be an ethnic Russian area, at least the Donbass, and that uh, we want every president since Bush Sr. to know that if you incur or become aggressive towards, you know, no, America doesn't, America and the EU, uh, the Germans realize that if they want to take over Europe, it couldn't be at the end of a sword, it would have to be at the end of a checkbook. So when the Germans decided to take over uh, Europe, they decided that they had to always hide behind the, the protection of, uh, well, she wanted it. She really wanted to be with me. She totally wanted it. Like this not coercion totally didn't uh, fool her. Totally, you know, like, man, it's like opt in. Like they really, everybody really wants to be part of NATO. Everybody really wants to be part of the EU. Ah, uh, yeah, in the same way that uh, a hot girl likes being spoiled by a rich guy, maybe. But uh, in many cases, once the money runs out or the goodwill runs out, uh, see ya. But in this case, Ukraine was a, a step too far, right? And for everybody who believes that Russia was not prepared for this war, uh, they've been prepared since they've been saving up money, they've been fighting uh, uh, um, sanctions, and they've been preparing since 2014. But why not get rid of the moth-eaten, uh, mothball-eaten, crappy uh, people, shitty soldiers, old gear, as a way of drawing out the enemy, right? Go ahead and um, roll out a bunch of weak-ass-looking, broken-winged birds and see how many cats pounce on it uh, as a way of kind of figuring out what you're up against, right? Simulation only goes so far. You can actualize the threat that way. And of course, if I were Putin, if I were Russia, it's exactly what I would do. I mean, come on, there's been warnings for like forever and uh, there's no like reason to be too concerned about uh, about the existential crisis, right? This, this has never been an issue of anybody ever being afraid of Putin, who at the same time, exactly in the same moment, is both poor, garbage, weak, everybody's drunk, everybody's sick, everybody's got cancer, everybody is corrupt. There's no way that anybody can fight. Concurrently, when, oh no, oh no, Putin totally wants to take back uh, the former Soviet satellite countries, and then wants to roll over Western Europe, and then wants to take over the entire world. So someone needed to organize the propaganda because you can't concurrently, can you? Can you concurrently? Can you concurrently both be uh, a fearsome uh, Hitler who intended to take over Europe at the point of the spear and also be completely pathetic and easily be rolled over by a corrupt, the second, first or second most corrupt country in the world, y Ukraine, right? So I don't know if you can be those two things at the same time. I guess people are stupid or weak-minded or, or they're geniuses. Like uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald said, they have the ability to believe that uh, Putin is both completely pathetic and his country is completely poor and the sanctions completely work, and all of his weapons are completely old, and all of his tanks have, have dry rot, and uh, he completely sucks, while concurrently believing that his goal is to take over the world by rolling over and taking back Soviet Union and taking back 
Western Europe and Eastern Europe and, and, and North Europe and Southern Europe and, and then Great Britain and then take over uh, the Mediterranean states. Bwahaha, whatever, whatever Russian is for bwahaha, whatever Russian is for bwahaha. So anyway, so that's exactly what I would have done. I would have uh, given 30 years of warning. And the moment uh, it became obvious that there was formal intent to uh, apply for, even in terms of um, their new constitution in the uh, preamble or the preface, there was a written intent to join uh, NATO, if not the EU. And that was just a bridge too far with everything that went on in terms of the color revolution against Ukraine by the West and the placement of Zelensky into office. Uh, and the f fact that Russia really feels, because of words by powerful officials, everybody wants to uh, regime change Russia. They don't want to have a democratically elected uh, Russia. They want to regime change. They want to find uh, Vladimir Zelensky instead of Volodymyr Zelensky, and they want to place him into the presidency of Russia. This isn't about um, regime change which is to say, make the people organically rise up and democratically elect a new uh, president. This is about, um, hey, hey, how are you? Been a long time. Um, this is about, um, you know, uh, forceful. This is about like Latin American strategy. And uh, this is about uh, placing puppets, uh, putting hands up people's butts and uh, running them like a puppeteer. And so, but obviously, I mean, if I'm the West uh, and I have an agenda to foment liberal democracy, and if I don't like the way Russia's behaving, I don't like the way Hungary's behaving, I don't like the way Poland's behaving, and I believe that Russia, even though I really don't believe that Russia is the epicenter of, of uh, political propaganda, that's the State Department, I, as the West, are like... Let's go east, man. If we can make everybody believe that this is a democratic opt-in process and nobody's ever been coerced or regime changed into making these decisions or even threatened or blackmailed into making these decisions, um, then, then why not let the good times roll? Besides, the West always has been hungry for the breadbasket known as Ukraine. Um, if the future goal of moving people into various places in the EU based on where they'll live, where there'll be uh, farming, to be able to accommodate a flood of new populations as a result of climate migration and so forth. You need that freaking land. That land is going to be the breadbasket, and that's the missing piece. Uh, Western Europe is so urbanized, uh, and its populations are growing so extensively that you need a vast territory of arable land and so it's not about democracy it's not about ukraine it's not about zelensky it's not about freedom it's not about autonomy and it's not about sovereignty it's about uh location 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 and the location 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 is i want your land and i can make bread oh and i love the land and ukraine makes wheat and that's so sweet and you know russia is like Fuck that. We got nukes and, you know, we've uh, contracted as far as we want to and far as we can. We're, we have a big country, but it's only Russia now. And we gave you 30 years of warning and you never believed us. And you've been uh, attacking us in slow motion for 30 years. And uh, you have said yes, but you've never written anything down. And so I don't believe you hear me. So in many ways... It seems obvious to me that uh, Russia was baited into war, and it's I can't even blame the Ukrainians because they were just used, and they've been used in slow motion since at least 2014. Um, and Russia really has nothing to be ashamed about. They have all the access. They have all the access to all the uh, all the gas, all the oil, um, and they've never vindictively. Uh, before, I was living in Berlin in 2008, 2010, and there's never been a vindictive act of cutting off uh, oil or gas 
to Western Europe, which was almost wholly dependent on it, in the way that, you know, uh, Israel is willy-nilly turning off uh, electricity and gas to Gaza, right? So Russia could have played that game, could have played that game a lot, um, and never did. So I don't want to call Russia the good guys, but they're certainly not the bad guys in this scenario. So as you can see, this podcast is about me agreeing with both sides. If I were the West, I'd want that breadbasket. If I were the East, I would say, fuck you. Those are my ethnic people. I need a DMZ. You have nuclear bombs wrapping Russia like, uh, like a choker, like, uh, like a fetish choker, like a studded collar, where each stud is a nuclear silo. And I don't want you to get any freaking closer than you are right now because all of my big cities are sort of on the western side of vast Soviet Russia. And so, no, no means no. Uh, in an environment of rape, do you know what I mean? If I say for 30 years that you can't touch me uh, and that you can't put a finger in me and that you can't put the tip in and that I need a condom and all this other stuff and I make my boundaries really clear and then you fuck me, I'll call that rape and I will respond with, uh, with extreme violence. So... I get where Russia's coming from. They gave you plenty of warning. It's like it's like ignoring the rattle on a rattlesnake for 30 years and then being really surprised when you get a uh, rattlesnake bite on your thigh or shin or dick or whatever. All right, now to the Middle East. Uh, Israel has never, ever, ever wanted a two-state solution. Palestine has never, ever, ever wanted a two-state solution. Uh, Camp David has been the only place that has wanted a two-state solution. You know, Arafat is the only person who even suggested it, and maybe, you know, maybe some of the presidents. Nobody wants it, and the only reason why uh, the West Bank and Gaza aren't raised and thrown into the sea is because of, uh, of optics. The only reason why the state of Palestine persists is, is maybe 50% for optics, uh, and 50% because, um, you know, Israelis don't want to actually do any of the shit work. So in many cases, I believe that maybe Palestinians do a lot of the Mexican work and South American work that Americans don't like to do either, or the work that Turks do in Germany, you know, I don't know. Are they de facto slave labor to benefit Israel? Uh, is this a analog to uh, the entire ideas of uh, 1920s and 30s uh, ghettos. The original definition of ghetto, right, is, uh, is you know, a, is, is, isn't it uh, uh, neighborhoods, Jewish neighborhoods in, in, um, in, uh, in Holland, in uh, the Netherlands? Isn't that um, sort of where that comes from, like beyond the pale? Aren't there uh, neighborhoods that were only Jewish people were kept and, and they had the same kind of stratagem as the Israelis have towards uh, the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank? Um, I think that there's blue passes, green passes, and yellow passes according to whether you can go as a Palestinian to Jerusalem or, or whatever, like certain limitations. Um, very similar to like, you know, whether you can access the VIP room in like Duck Club. So it's this amazing analog of the way Israelis are perceived as treating the Palestinians are akin to 30s Germany, how they were treating the Jews in Germany and basically the Austro-Hungarian the former Austro-Hungarian Empire. So, so if Palestine, if Gaza especially, is uh, the equivalent of a pressure cooker, uh, and if there is a desire to wipe Israel off the map, and if the quote uh, from the river to the sea is accurately represents the, uh, is it the animus? The hatred and... Uh, resentment and 
and mortal uh, hatred that Palestine has to Israel and Islam might have to Jews in general uh, if there's a desire of zero-sum game and if the Middle East, including Israel and Palestine, have never been, except for political um, uh, diplomatic words, has never been a non-zero-sum game, then uh, October 7th was completely inevitable. However, um, I know that Israel has been itching for an opportunity like this for the last 30 years, have been looking for a uh, an unprompted, quote-unquote, even though... Um, the Palestinians have been walled into a place, and apparently they're fucking, 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 fucking. Like, like tell the pro-choice West that there is no, uh, there is no Planned Parenthood in anywhere in the Muslim world. So the fact that fifty percent of um, of Palestinians are fifteen or younger, fifteen years of age or younger, uh, means that. No matter where war is, there's going to be an extreme amount of under 18 deaths. 50% of all Palestinians are 15 or under, uh, which is, you know, which is another reason why uh, Western lefties, pro-choice, uh, my body, my choice um, activists would probably not like um, living in Gaza because your body is not your choice. Uh, making babies is number one job in the Middle East when um, both Israel and Palestine is trying to um, outgrow the other side. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. So um, it isn't hard if you are surrounded by impoverished, sick, oppressed, under underutilized young people, lots of babies, lots of mouths to feed, uh, contained, oppressed, surrounded by people who are looking for a reason to kill you. I mean, let's talk about inner city rage. Let's talk about American inner city rage. Let's talk about uh, George Floyd. No matter how flawed a character he is, he was the perfect catalyst at the perfect time, even if he was manufactured. Uh, even if he was manufactured. Even a manufactured... Um, George Floyd experience would not uh, would not go hunting if it weren't for the fact that there was blood in the water and there was gasoline in the air and all you need to do is light a match. So anytime you pressure cooker a community, there will eventually be um, um, predictable, unpredictable responses. So the uh, whether it was an Israeli attempt to bait uh, Gaza into doing something so drastic that it gave supposedly the kind of carte blanche that Israel's been wanting for 30 years, the kind of carte blanche that America seemed to receive after 9-11. Um, and disappointingly, it didn't work because we're going through a, uh, we're going through a, we're going through a 1984 Pearl Revolt currently, and in a world of liberal parole revolt, um, in a populist world, 99% of global populists are not Trumpers. 99% of global populists are um, uh, the poor and the disenfranchised. While America is trying to make it a culture war, the rest of the world is trying to is realizing that it's a class war, and um, and so I totally get why October 7th happened. The timing seems right. It happened during a holy holiday. Um, uh, I would dare say in a world of observant Muslims, a, uh, a uh, um, uh, Burning Man type EDM, like free sex, free love festival is probably uh, the final straw and uh, a sure sign of the devil and a sure sign of Satan and a sure sign of of white devil, uh, Israeli Satan manifest, and as a result, perfectly predictable, but also perfectly predictable, as I said in a pre previous episode, considering that Israel has a conversion rate of one Israeli traded for a thousand Palestinians, 
that, um, you know, the obvious response that I expected uh, from Israel after, and this might actually turn out to be true, but let's say there's 2.5 million people in Gaza. I just assume based on, let's say the number is 1,500 instead of 1,700. Let's say there were 1,500 um Israeli civilians that were killed on October 7th. Based on the thousand to one ratio, um, I believe that with regards to an eye to an eye, um, I believe that the Israelis, the, the Israelis basically want, you know, 1.5 million uh, Gazian souls and, and they're willing to take it from the West Bank or from Gaza or wherever else. And the only way uh, that it's not going to happen is if uh, there is enough uh, world response. The white blood cell count needs to be so over the top that uh, Israel will feel uh, like their existential crisis won't come from without, that their existential crisis and their uh, complete collapse will, become, will come from within. Uh, so... You know, based on all of this, I mean, I can understand why uh, there are riots in the United States. I can understand why there is looting in the United States. I can understand why there's lawless outrage in the United States. I can understand why there is a desire to claim uh, cultural imperialism and to say, in my life, my crimes are my culture. You don't get to define what is my culture and what is my crimes. I completely get it, but I also get that um, even people in inner city neighborhoods or around the country uh, will pay people to kill people who are making them feel unsafe. So like um, I think Glenn Beck or maybe Alex Jones or somebody said uh, that inevitably in places like New York and Chicago, there will within short order uh, become, oh, become there will be lots of people. Uh, who will be doing? Uh, who will be do? Who will be taking care of criminals on their own? Um, I forgot the term for what that is. Um, um, it's like you know that movie Death Wish in Death Wish Two, right? Uh, um, the uh, if if you if your family gets killed by criminals, you will then take and you will take the law into your own hands, and you will. Uh, take justice into your own hands. And I know it starts with a V, but I can't remember the word. Uh, in smart movies, they always call people who are superheroes, they call them this. They call the guy who uh, was Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy who um, killed the guy in the subway, the vigilante. There will be vigilante justice. And the vigilante justice will be called domestic terrorism it will be called white supremacy. It will be called um, uh, um, MAGA republicanism. It will be called, it, there will be a call to uh, make guns illegal, uh, make pistols illegal, make constitutional carry illegal. There will be a pledge. Uh, they will call it, um, uh, what is it called? Militias. They'll call it, uh, uh, Nazi militias, they'll call it white supremacist militias, they'll call it skinhead militias, and what it'll be is it'll be just emergent vigilante justice, because if one side says, my crime is my culture, another side can say, uh, my safety is my culture, or my gun is my culture, or like Mandalore, my gun is my religion. So... I understand everybody what they're doing, but uh, um, at the end of the day, I believe that the gambit is always to kill as many people as humanly possible. Um, it's the cancer gambit, right? If you're cancer, you're going to replicate and try to uh, kill your host before you're going to try to get to stage four before any doctor realizes what's going on or white blood cells start to get you know, in, uh, involved or if there's any chemotherapy or if there's any, uh, stem cell therapy or if there's any, um, uh, sur surgical intervention, 
and you need to go ahead and you need to try to kill your host or you need to kill your your adversary quickly enough in today's day and age before the rest of the world, be it the UN or your enemy's enemy or whatnot, uh, starts uh, deciding or just the, the global media or the population or the young people or the protesters or BlackRock or ESG or uh, multinationals or um, um, Wall Street. You need to get as much dastardly dirty work done before people stop investing in your country, in your companies, in your future. Um, World Bank stops loaning you money. Uh, countries stop refueling or or refueling you and giving you uh, weapons and giving you this. Or just in general, you need to get as much done uh, before uh, the attention of the world uh, forgets about you and goes on to the next thing. The perfect example is the fact that, I mean, in my opinion, Ukraine war has always been doomed. Russia's always been going to win. Uh, as I said in a previous episode, uh, because everybody's afraid of Russia's nukes and because everybody's afraid of entangling NATO, uh, Russia hasn't had to uh, risk any. Russia Russia hasn't had to risk any um, at all civilians, aside from the low civilian count resulting from long-range, small, long-range explosive uh, drones. And Ukraine has been basically... Um, where all this shit hits all the fans. The only Russians who have been killed are um, very literally mercenaries or Russian military uh, or probably uh, prisoners uh, with uh, Russian military garb. Um, Ukraine is peppered by mines, peppered by cluster bombs, peppered by munitions and, and shelling and shooting and explosions, and missiles, and rockets, and all that fun stuff. Uh, there are no minefields in Russia. There are no unexploded ordnance in Russia. Um, and so it's always been an... Un um, Ukraine has always had both arms tied behind its back. Uh, so it was a foregone conclusion. Uh, Russia was always going to get uh, their Donbass... Uh, the West was always going to get Western Ukraine. Uh, the rest was sort of a gambit to make money and to play games and to help economies and to figure out who the good guys and bad guys were and to blame um, Western corruption on uh, Eastern. It was, you know, 1984. Uh, Eurasia has always been the enemy. Now it's East Asia. Eurasia, you know, uh, Russia's always been the enemy. Uh, Palestine has always been the enemy. Iran has always been the enemy. Uh, China's always been the enemy. North Korea's always been the enemy. Um, Venezuela's always been the enemy. Yada, yada, yada. So, on that note, uh, the good news is that really only 11 people ever listen to my episodes, so I probably am not going to suffer much from this, except for if for unforeseen reasons, something goes viral. But as you know, I'm your favorite whataboutist. And, um, uh, oh man, I don't know what you guys are seeing, but I can see clearly now the rain is gone. Talk to you soon. Love you. Aloha. Mahalo. This was the Chris Abraham show season six, episode 14. And we'll talk soon. Ciao. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.